Hi, I'm Jennifer Jill Araya. And I'm Sarah Beth Gower. Welcome to the Crafting Audiobooks podcast, where we discuss the art and craft of audiobooks, and we aim to go deep quick. Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's episode. We are here with audiobook narrator Aaron Bennett. Aaron, welcome. Oh, it's so great to be with you. We're so glad to have you here. And um, we are continuing our special spotlight on nonfiction. So we're going to discuss nonfiction with Aaron today. We're really excited about that. Aaron, question number one for you. We all know people, and they're usually either outside of the audiobook industry or they're newer to narration, um, who make the assumption that nonfiction narration is actually easier than fiction narration. And we would love to know, what is your reaction to that idea? Well, don't take my word for it. Um, um, all, All someone needs to do in order to disabuse themselves of that notion is to record a nonfiction audiobook. I, I guess I guess anyone could be under the assumption that all they have to do is read aloud to themselves um, and 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 to make to get the information across, just to say the words as they're on the page. But that's that's going to make a pretty terrible audiobook, um, honestly. If I'm if I'm uh, <laughs> pulling any punches, and as I sit here in a hot booth, I'm not. I'm not inclined to pull any punches. So, um, you know, I, I sorry to kind of be sassy, but first of all, is like, yes, try that. Try, try that for yourself and and um, and see how it goes, A, number one. And B, number two is even if you do it and you, uh, you know, and you've just sort of made sense of it to yourself as you're as you're going in real time, if you listen back to it, I I dare say you'd be disappointed. So can you make an audiobook without without any effort that's nonfiction? Sure. Will it will it be a good audiobook? I don't think so. Um, so I I take I take non nonfiction very seriously. Um, it has its own uh, bevy of challenges, um, its own special bouquet. <laughs> uh, and while some of those demands are different from fiction, they're 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 still demands. Absolutely. I would love for you to dig into that very last statement there that you said that. Nonfiction has different demands than fiction. What differences do you see? Well, for one thing, an author wrote both of these things, right? And an author, or maybe more than one author, someone with with passion in their heart and conviction in their brain put pen to paper or or you know, typed on their computer and created something for a reason. You know, a nonfiction book is not reading uh you know reading a uh an encyclopedia entry even even that has an author you know every everything has authorship and editing and um and creation and packaging and a point of view so fiction you know you know fiction it's almost like um we almost have a a, a shortcut to a, an opinion or a feeling or a character because they're presented to us right off the page with nonfiction, there's just as much um, identity in the authorship and point of view and intention of the author, but the narrator doesn't have the um, the luxury, if you will, of delving into different characters. They have to follow a train of thought from page one, from, from the first sentence on page one to the very last on sometimes page 452. So you're following in some ways a very long stream of thought or a stream of consciousness or a stream of an author's conversation in nonfiction back and forth with themselves or with a possibly an unseen audience or with another person or with their own thoughts or you're you're still you still have a character in in many ways and you still have something that's that's there that has never been in existence before so it's so it's new and it's your job to bring it to life so you know generally there's there may be one character or in nonfiction or there may be hundreds of characters who put in tiny brief appearances in quotes 
or in sections or in phone calls or in texts or in passages lifted from something or in other books that are quoted. And we still have to bring those to life. Um, so, but, but we still have to maintain that author, that author connection. It's almost like, if you will, a bit of a one person show. Hmm. If you, if you think, if you need a way to activate it, to activate that. It was interesting. I just saw, I just saw a play last night. I saw the opening, the opening night at the Pasadena Playhouse of a, of a really fascinating play called The Sound Inside. And it's a two-hander. But I realized as I was watching this play that the whole play could have been the main, the main character, the woman who plays the professor. It's played by Amy Brenneman. She was fantastic. And, and he was fantastic too, but the whole thing could have been in her mind. Hmm. The whole production could have been her. She could have said every line in that show. And, you know, uh, 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 hundreds of us were sitting spellbound watching her in a, in a pin spot. There could have been no set. There could have been no music. All that could, there needed to be was her, actually her voice. And, uh, because she made she made everything so real, um, she could have brought those other, you know, anybody else who appeared on stage along with her, and I would have known who she was talking about. So, the kind of the one woman show or the one person show, I think, is helpful for both fiction and nonfiction. Yeah, what I'm really hearing you say is that both fiction and nonfiction have characters and have a point of view, but that nonfiction sometimes has the added challenge of it being. Um, more of a challenge for the narrator to really discover who is this character or these characters and what is the point of view that it doesn't necess- it doesn't always leap off the page as clearly as in fiction but that it's the same journey either way absolutely sometimes it's too clear sometimes you're doing a, a quote of a, you know a, some famous historical event that has been covered and covered, and you've heard the radio clip of, of saying, you know, a day that will live that will live in infamy, you know. And sometimes there are moments that are so clear that you have to be careful not to imitate them too much or copy them. You've got to provide an echo of that history, but not a we don't want to bring the listener out of it. I'm not Winston Churchill or or Carol Churchill, for that matter, or or Martin Luther King. So you know, I I have to I have to sort of com- com- encompass those things that happened in the moment, um, but I cannot character I cannot make a caricature of them or characterize them too much. So I have to I have to sort of you know uh, lift the balloon a little bit in the direction of the listener's memory to recall sometimes, and sometimes. Quotes and passages are from something from people I've never met, so I've got to do my best to um, to communicate that information without um, imposing a character on it as well. <laughs> so um, we want to honor the things we need to honor and keep it keep it coherent and keep it natural. Sure, I hear you saying that there are just a lot of really sensitive choices that narrators need to make when narrating any nonfiction piece. And sometimes those choices require a level of, I guess, awareness of the text that fiction doesn't always require. In fiction, it's a lot more obvious frequently. Sure. And you've got all kinds of description possibly to lead you to a a character. But I have to say, excellent nonfiction is, you know, a great piece of... (laughs) A terrific piece of journalism. I, I see the the pictures start in my head uh, almost as um, if you read a you know brilliant in depth pieces from say the Washington Post. It, I, I feel like I'm there when when the writing is so is so on point and so direct and so evocative. Um, it's its own kind of storytelling, and um, what I have to make sure is that I don't impose my own my own stuff <laughs> on top of it. I can make all sorts of wacky choices and, and bold, bold characterizations for fiction, depending on the, you know, the tone of the piece. But I have to, you know, I have to be careful to keep it contained when we're talking nonfiction. 
that makes a lot of sense that in either case, we don't want to impose just our own stuff on top of the text. We want to be enhancing the text in a way that doesn't detract from the text, but that in nonfiction, that can be more sensitive or trickier right, right. to achieve. It all, com- all comes down to the author in both cases. It has to come from the author, not from my imagination or what, you know, what I'm what I'm trying to do, but what what does the what is the blueprint that the author is creating? And I'm gonna, if I'm gonna build the house, you know, the author has provided me all the tools, the plans, everything else, everything else. I have to, I can't like stick a gable or a dormer window like right in the middle of the of the of the, of the, of the thing. I don't, I don't want it to look, I don't want it to look strange. I don't want it to sound weird. I've got to, I've got to build the building that the author intended me to build, not something that I just kind of want to do for my own sake. That's, that's true with with both fiction and nonfiction, I tend to have a little bit of a, I don't want to say tighter reins or that I'm restraining myself, but rather it's just, uh, it's just focus. It's, it's more kind of laser beam. It's, it's gotta be, ah, laser beam isn't right because that would be exhausting. I don't know if I can sustain laser beam for too long. It's a little more diffuse than that, but it's something that I have to be, I have to be relaxed about and i have to yeah not impose my own my own stuff got to pay attention to the author above above all else well that leads us beautifully into our second question actually which is what is your process when you're stepping into the booth knowing that that is your job to portray the author's intents and intent and feeling and thoughts. Um, how do you approach that? You know, you're sitting down, you've got your manuscript in front of you. What are you doing to make sure that you are capturing what the author intends for you to do? Well, I pay attention to my feelings. I pay attention to my feelings and my thoughts as I react to what this author has to say. I try to, I try to breathe in, in the very beginning, in the very beginning, as I'm taking it in, I've got to take it in without judgment. I have to, I'm not saying I'm a neutral party. I don't, I don't believe that I can ever be neutral about anything really, but I can, I can be influenced and I can be flexible about, about what, what I'm, what I'm taking in. And I, I am non-judgmental in that aspect. So I, I try to start things with kind of a what if. What if, you know, what if, what if I, uh, you know, if I'm talking about something in nonfiction, um, I'll think there's a, there's a book I did about, um, a famous madam in New York City, a great historical figure. Um, not, not much was written about her. A lot of, a lot has been uncovered. And I had to, I had to really go, all right, I, I, whatever I think I know about, about, uh, a New York City madam, Mm. uh, I, I'm just going to toss away and I'm going to hear what the author has to say about, the you know the who what where when how why of all of this, so I got to stay out of my own way and see what starts uh, jumping out at me from the author's point of view, and then run with that a little bit. Is it um, is it the author? Uh, you know, is it kind of like you wouldn't you wouldn't believe this what I found communicating with an audience, or is it is it this is the time this is the kind of time it was this was happening this was happening i'm going to set the scene for you and then who appears on the scene the person we're talking about hmm. kind of in that bright spotlight or it it can even be just the facts ma'am you know this happened and this happened which was followed by this and this and this and this and this and this and then we're going to talk about why there there are so many different ways to tell a story and, um, yeah, I find, I find that if, when I'm in that booth, if I get a little carried away with myself, all I have to do is I've got to just find that inner, um, that inner compass again, uh, pointing true North to the author, the, <laughs> that will, that will take, uh, that will take me where I need to go. I love what you said that you can't be totally neutral, but you can be open and flexible, like what you're describing sounds to me like a good way of being a human in the world in general, like listening and being open to what you're receiving, but knowing that you can't, that you're also your own vessel who will then express it through your own perspective. So I'm just I'm very struck by the beauty of what you're describing of how you digest and receive and then offer um, these nonfiction titles. 
Well, thank you. And and to be honest with you, I have listened to to some of my my early my early efforts at nonfiction and some of the things that strike me when I'm when I'm not as on my game, I sound didactic. I sound like I'm and this and this and this and this and this period. You know, I sound like I know what you know, know what I'm saying and I'm telling you about it. And that doesn't interest me um as a listener or uh you know, I, I times like that I haven't done my job. So I find that uh as excited as I am to tell stories, I cannot get ahead of myself and I've got to I've got to let the author is the author discovering this at the same time that that you know kind of is it something where a story is unfolding not something that i've got kind of like wound up and that i'm going to pitch to you over the plate uh so i've i've learned not to not to wind up so much and and pitch and trying to throw something at something but rather try to <laughs> I don't know, I guess like maybe almost field it, <laughs> like f- almost field the ball rather than throwing the ball. So yes, I'm in charge. I, I'm piloting it, but um, actually the author is piloting it. So maybe I'm just the co-pilot. I don't know. Hmm. Between like baseball and and <laughs> and flying a plane, these are things I know nothing about. <laughs> but I guess I'm just trying to say uh, the more flexible, the more open, the less of my bad actor habits get in the way, <laughs> the better the better my performance ends up being and the more true I am to the story. I'm really hearing you say that it matters that you stay in the moment and in the text exactly as you're narrating it rather than getting ahead of yourself too much or thinking about you know, what someone should take away from this. You're just really staying very close to the text and allowing that to dictate how you perform. Well, if we play the end of the scene, what is there to watch? You know, we know Blanche Dubois is going to be carted away to the to the psychiatric ward. I mean, why why have why have anything come come before? It's 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 that old drama school stuff. Don't don't play the end of the scene. Don't play the end of the scene. I think I understand why. Because if you're going to do a 14 or 15 hour fiction book, if you start if you start with a point of view that's gotten to so so shortly uh, shortly and so um, definitively, then there's nowhere to go. Then that's just a, a sort of a screed that's just repeated ad nauseum in different ways. So I'm not saying that. I ever want to be less intelligent or in the dark than the author is, but there's got to be a bringing out of this information that doesn't um, didactically, uh, you know, sort of badger the the listener with a conclusion before we've even gotten out of chapter one. Sure. Yeah. What I'm hearing you describe is a really respect, not just respectful, but more effective um, offering to the listener because isn't that isn't that what we're seeking as humans is this back and forth exploration? We're not just wanting like lectures from each other or to feel like we're not heard or participating. And so I feel that's so beautiful. And I also am very struck by the way like you listened back to your work to know how it impacted you as a listener and you learned from that. You said, I don't like how this impacts me as a listener and how can I shift this so that I'm offering more? And that's just very rich, I think. Yeah, that's oh man, so so much is learned through humiliation and embarrassment. <laughs> I mean, maybe those words are too strong, but but uh, they're not they're not strong when I'm feeling them. Yeah, but, uh, you know, just kind of the humility of going like, oh, why did I why did I do that? Why did I act so much like I knew what I was talking about and that you didn't, and that I had to tell you what it what it was? Nobody really likes that unless we're being invited into the process. Unless we're we're partnering with with the audience, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I don't want to feel alienated from the experience. I don't want to alienate my listener, and um, you know, I think I think every every actor, at least I'll only speak for myself, but every actor has a, t- a tendency to something, right? To to some some I don't know, just some part that's just not so good. And I, I contend I, with nonfiction, 
my habit, if I'm not, if I'm not careful or if I'm not conscious, is is just to be kind of a bit of a blowhard. And I I really I really am aware when I when I listened to myself doing that, uh, it made an impression on me. And I went, I I don't want to I don't want to do this. Maybe it was a paragraph out of a out of a book. I don't know, but but um, yeah, I back and forth. I, and I love I love listening to people in conversation who are passionate about something. It's not saying, oh, I I can't take any step in any direction because I, I'm afraid I'll sound like I know what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about that at all. I'm talking about not getting ahead of the author and playing the end of the scene. I love what you're describing of um, the art you're offering, constantly growing in your own art. And as you do, like when you offer your art, you're offering consciously and unconsciously. And so when you look back at it, you learn things about your art is a mirror for things that you want to grow in yourself as a human which is the same thing as what you want to grow in yourself as a narrator. Like how amazing is that process oh, that you're describing? It's amazing that you're, that you're bringing this. I mean, you said it so beautifully. Why, yeah. Why does this, this stuff just dovetails with life? Right. <laughs> I like my kiddo is in a, a school that I didn't know she was going to be at because there was a spot open for her. And I, I, I hate, I kind of hate change. Change d- uh, discombobulates me. And my, uh, my first reaction is anger. You know, it's like, what, what, nah, this is messing everything up. And if I had just, it took, after I calmed down a little bit and I just kind of let myself uh, be in the moment and, and listen to what was happening and listen to her experience and keep my eyes open and my ears open and my mouth shut for a little bit and, and begged myself to have a little patience, I breathed, I calmed down and I realized that everything is okay and she loves it. And and it was actually a good thing. So n- knowing that about myself, I-, I think as an actor and as a person, I tend to jump to suspicion to, I tend, I, I have a tendency to jump to um, opinions that, that then I get this humbling experience of walking back <laughs> and realizing I did not see the whole, the whole picture. So in some ways it, that makes, it makes me a good audiobook narrator because <laughs> I've read the book before I start. So I've had my own feelings about it. I've had my my assumptions. Oh, and I've had my assumptions um changed. I've had my assumptions, I've had the thoughts that I was so sure about um completely undone and refuted. I've had my prejudices annihilated. I've I've become open to something I didn't know anything about or something I thought I knew about. And by the time I get to the end of that book, I go, whoa, I thought I knew something about, you know, the turn of, turn of the century Brooklyn. And, and boy, did I have a lot to learn. So wow. this experience of like just constantly being humbled, um, I'm not going to fault myself for being human. Um, I'm past that. I'm, I'm past my 20s. I'm okay with being human. <laughs> um, but yeah. I love I love nonfiction. I love I love learning and I love kind of getting my ass kicked by it. Uh, I mean, you're giving me goosebumps because, you know, I've often talked to nonfiction narrators about how they love narrating nonfiction because they learn something new. And I feel like in this conversation, you're revealing a whole deeper layer of what learning something new even means and how you are going through that process so that you can then hopefully be a part of offering that gift to the listener in a way that, you know, maybe they're going to pick up because you're choosing to channel in as flexible and open a way as you can. Maybe they're going to hear something in a way that they wouldn't have heard if they were just reading it to themselves and not going through that conscious opening process. Um, So I'm just, I'm just like thrilled right now. I'm super like geeked out, excited about this. (laughs) Oh my gosh. I, I mean, it's, I, I, as you're saying that it just, goes I it goes back I'm just sort of scrolling back a little bit in my head about so many things I've learned about that things that I never would have learned about and you know because a human uh uh-huh, because a human wrote everything that I've narrated so far every person who writes a book who writes a work of nonfiction is a living breathing feeling opinionated questioning soul who's had something they'd want to discover 
or a bee in their bonnet, something they can't shake or, or an outrage that they have to investigate or something that won't let them go. And I, I find that, I find that when I started to look at, you know, at, in order not to be kind of intimidated by the intelligence of some of the, the works uh, that I was doing or going like, oh, wow, this is, this is a long ass book. You know, this is going to, this is going to be quite a, quite a dive. I, I, I better sound like I know what I'm talking about. Um, rather than that, as soon as I looked at the humanity of, as soon as I look at the humanity of who's writing this and what they're passionate about and what is turning them on about this or what is never letting them go about this, um, I almost feel like I'm having coffee with them or, or walking alongside them as they're telling me their ideas rather than, I don't know, like sitting in a lecture hall and they're really, really far away and I can't see them and I'm, you know, just like taking notes. When I feel like I can kind of, yeah, just be be alongside that author and know that they they wanted to write this, you know, as much as Toni Morrison wanted to write The Bluest Eye, you know, that there are topics that, like great works of fiction, nonfiction, um, are about some incredible aspects of our humanity. And some of some of that work leaves me as breathless as um the great works of fiction that I've been lucky to um spend time with. So and my God, you know, sometimes there's just times where you go, got through that one. <laughs> got <laughs> well, to the end of that chapter. Woo. <laughs> speaking of being a human, sometimes we're not in the deep artistic throes of the profundity of what can be. Oh heck, heck yes. <laughs> Put that put up put that on the on the mirror with lipstick. What you just said that was brilliant. No, we're not, we're not. So no, let let's. We all have those peak experiences, right? Sometimes you know it, and 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 that's great. Those are those are times that can sustain us, and we all have to eat, and we all have to pay the rent, and you know we all have to have a calendar that's full enough to support our lives. And not everything is, you know, not everything is going to be a peak experience. And in, in those moments, you know, you take a breath and you go, there's there's something for everyone. This is the challenge of the day for me. And, you know, there's there's an audience out there that's going to listen to this and it might be a peak experience for them. So it might be just what they want. So, you know, that's when you rely on your trust, your trust, your your technique. And being open and connecting with the author um, will we'll see you through. Mm -hmm. Turning to sort of digging our hands into the clay of some of the more technical details, fiction books, they frequently have a lot of different characters, um, character voices. This all helps hold that can help hold the listener's interest. Um, in nonfiction titles, there's often a lot less external action for the listener to hang on to. And I'm curious, what do you do differently in your narration of nonfiction to help guide the listener through the complexities and really keep them in the story that's unfolding? So particularly when, yes, when there are long sentences or long, long passages of description or, uh, you know, someone who's written this, who's, you know, is very intelligent, who's able to really take a lot of points within one sentence. Um, I try to stay very active physically in my booth. Um, I use, I use a lot. I use my hands a lot. I use, I mean, I can't, I can't take my eyes off the page, but I, I, I physicalize as much as possible to keep the energy going through through my body and through 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 that sentence through that passage um i might not be relying on characters but i have to follow the thought of the author right at the pace that the author is going up into the comma and then i've got to weave through the next thought to the comma and the next thought and the next to the dash 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 and to the ellipse and all of those things um i just have to really stay in line with their thought and i can't i can't let my energy flag before the author's done with their thought, and I can't, I can't blow my energy too soon, um, and then have nothing left, you know, 
I and be a you know deflating balloon through the through the weeds of the of the final when I finally get to the end of the sentence. So I got to keep that energy going. Um, you know, that's that's the type of thing where that flexibility comes into play. The author kind of if you forgive the expression. The author kind of has their way with me at, in terms of their breath patterns. Uh, my breath patterns are their breath patterns for this for this project. Sure, but you know, it's, I just I just have to take to take it on. I have to just. Um, sometimes I I get somebody whose whose pace and tone are similar to mine, and that's great because then that seems natural. Sometimes I've got to. I've got to relax a little bit into the that blueprint again and let the author let the author speak. Absolutely. I love what you had to say about using physicality to help you narrate in the booth. I attended a audiobook masterclass with Jamie Matler once several years ago and there was a line that was something to the effect of the the character in the book saying that's it you know like being really excited and of course if someone were to say that in real life they would move physically and the person who was was speaking you know being taught in the master class wasn't moving at all and Jamie had the person do that line several times using different physical movements to go along with it and it was astounding the difference that it made um i think a lot of people think that audiobook narration you know, requires you to be completely still and stationary in the booth. And actually our bodies are a really big part of doing this job well. And so I just really appreciated that you had that to say. Yeah. I'll keep different characters on different fingers. Mm. You know, my elbow comes out, my shoulder goes up, my head tilts. You know, there's a lot of things you can do while still having your eyes on that text. Sure. Um, and I think it's nice sometimes to fight against our uh, our constraints a little bit. I think that's activating. Um, I move my hips. I have one of those uh, little uh, hip thing, little foam things that you sit on. And I can, I found out I can really, without my chair squeaking, I can really kind of sashay my hips a little bit um, if I need to. I can kind of like, I can kind of twist around um, and not piss off my engineer, which is, you know, n- nothing's <laughs> no, no, nothing is, uh, nothing is worth pissing off the engineer. Um, the engineer is your friend. So, uh, so make him or her happy and, um, or them and, and, and all will be well, but, you know, but, but get right up to that, get right up to the edge if you can. Um, it helps. Well, believe it or not, we are already on to our last question of the, today's discussion, which all of us will answer. But Erin, I would love for you to start. I would love for you to tell me what is exciting you about the craft of nonfiction narration right now today? What what part of it just really lights you up inside? Well, gosh, everything we've been talking about has been lighting me up inside. <laughs> um, but I... I love uncovering truth. Mm-hmm. I I love finding a topic that I know nothing about that I that that someone has poured their heart and their life into into letting me learn something or letting me feel something about a time either a time in history or something happening right now that will change me. Uh I love being I love having my heart broken for a few hours of my life. I love having my life and my thinking altered, my perspective changed, my world enlarged. I love kind of walking around with these books inside of me. Mm-hmm. And that that makes me really excited. I now, now I want to sink my teeth into a nonfiction book. Thank you. I'm putting it out there in the universe. <laughs> Come to mama. Um, thank you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I love that idea of just really sinking your teeth into into learning something. That's beautiful. Sarah, what about you? What is exciting you right now today about the craft of nonfiction narration? Well, I am very intrigued today about why, and this is a broad generalization, and it depends on the book and somewhat on the narrator, but in general, um, in fiction, the convention is to really bring the dialogue, um, the character voices to life with like different, you know, sounds and, uh, you know, like like 
create uh, vocally the character. And in nonfiction, not to do that, to be pretty neutral and just have a gentle indication that someone is speaking. And as a listener, I am more engaged in fiction when the dialogue really comes to life like that. And I feel that nonfiction is more real when it doesn't and it's neutral. And so today I'm just curious about, well, well, why? Why do I feel that way? And why is that the general convention? Is it is it that in fiction, I want to feel like I'm inside the story? And in nonfiction, I want to feel like I'm hanging out with a real person who's telling me the story? Um, so I don't have like answers today. I'm just sort of excitedly musing about why each convention works for me in each genre. Though, again, of course, it's a it's a broad generalization, but just in general. Mm, fascinating. Yeah. Well, what is exciting me about nonfiction narration today is actually sort of goes back to something that Aaron was talking about a little bit earlier about how much we learn from the books that we narrate and that we grow as people and as narrators as a result. So last week I was taking some time off from work and I had two nonfiction books that I'd put put on hold at my library come up for me so that I could check them out. So I had two books that I needed to listen to in a short period of time, both of them nonfiction. And as a listener, I was just amazed with how much I learned from those two nonfiction books that I was listening to. And it sort of made me start thinking about how much I've learned and changed as a person and as a narrator as a result of the information in the books that I've narrated over the years. Um, There's that old saying that in five years, you're going to be exactly the same person you are today, except for the people you meet and the books you read. And I I really do feel like... um, the nonfiction books that I narrate make me a better person, which in turn makes me a better artist and a better actor. And um, yeah, it's just something that I'm really enjoying about about narration and specifically nonfiction narration today. Mm. Well, Erin, thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. This has been a beautiful discussion. And I know it's given me lots of nuggets of wisdom to ponder over, and I'm sure it has for Sarah and our our listeners as well. So thank you so much for, for sharing your time and sharing your passion for nonfiction narration. I'm, I'm really thrilled that you asked me. And um, thank you for these beautiful, thought-provoking questions and, and for doing this. It has truly been a joy. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening to Crafting Audiobooks. We've been your hosts, Jennifer Jill Araya and Sarah Beth Gower. Wishing you happy audiobook listening and or crafting. Bye for now. <laughs>